Welcome to this Business Central launch event for the 2024 release Wave 1. My name is Kenny Pontopidan. And I'm Jens Møller Petersen. And together we work on the AL runtime and the database. In this session, we're going to talk about the data stack and the AL runtime. And then we have a few other sessions on the web service stack and reporting changes. So let's talk data. In this release wave, we added some new capabilities to the number sequence object, and we also tuned the existing methods. So first of all, next current exist methods are up to 32% faster. And we also introduced these two new methods. One, the ability to restart a number sequence, and two, the, the ability to get multiple numbers without having to call SQL every single time. So the way they work is for restart, before this, you would have to like drop the sequence, create a new one. With the new restart method, you can simply, as the code example here states, you can restart to a particular uh, number, and then you start picking numbers from there. Similarly, range start is a way for you to get an interval of, uh, an interval of numbers. You can, of course, achieve this with a number sequence if you, if you increment by, say, 10, you would get 10 numbers each time. But in this case, you can also simply say, I would like a range of something, and that will then, for the increment you have chosen, give you that range without having to call the database. Yeah, so you're basically saving a database call for every time you need a number. So if you have a range of 100 numbers, it's not one call compared to 100. Yes. So that's it for number sequences, actually something a lot of people start noticing that this can speed up uh, quite significant uh, uh, the insert performance of things compared to, to auto increments. Yeah, particularly also compared to this where you lock the last record in order to pick the highest number, etc., which can really hurt your performance with, with locking scenarios. Yeah. All right. Now let's talk about another problem we've had, which is the time it takes to clean up the changelog entries. We have seen changelog entry tables growing to very large sizes, to the point where even setting up retention policies would time out, and deleting elements from the changelog entry would also time out. So we basically had to make this faster to enable our customers to get out of this situation. In order to do that, we optimized some internal workings, but we also needed to create a new method, which for now is smart for on-premises because it is a little bit of a double-edged sword. But let's talk about this new alter key method that you might see if you're coding with the on-premise um, keyword. So the alter key, it disables keys during the current transaction meaning that it is, it's almost the same as if you've dropped the index and then you do all your deletes and then you re-enable it. And it is automatically re-enabled when the current transaction ends. That can either be due to the transaction being canceled due to an error, in which case the transaction is rolled back, or unsuccessful completion, or add an explicit AL commit. So why aren't we just opening this up Always. Well, it's not always a good idea because the index needs to be rebuilt again afterwards when it is re-enabled. So it is only viable when you need to delete a lot of data. This has allowed us to speed up the deletion of changelog entries significantly and hence allowing our customers to clean up those tables. Now, small Announcement, we have previously said that we would remove the force order and loop join server settings. They are now, and it was announced in 23, it was a thing from the past, now it is removed. All right, let's talk about the runtime. One of the things that if you have been to any of our uh, Jens and I session from the past, actually from directions a few years back, we handed out these sheets where you could vote yes. on features. And this on is paper. On paper. For yeah. GDPR reasons. I know. Then we could burn them. Yes. 
And now, uh, now one of these ideas actually made it to the product, tooltips on table fields. So with this release wave, as a developer, you can now define field tooltips uh, once on the table. And any page uh, that, uh, that use these fields would just inherit the tooltips. You don't have to define them on multiple pages. Uh, can I add a comment there? Yes. Now, of course, if you don't want the tooltip that was defined on the table, then you can still override it on the control, just like you can with captions. So think about the same pattern as for captions. Yes. This gives some opportunities, advantages. This is actually why we build it in the first place now. Uh, first of all, we can use it in Copilot features internally. And later, we might do the same for queries and maybe in report data sets. So you can define things on the table level and inherit it up. But for now, that's science fiction not coming in this release wave. So the way to define a tooltip on a table field is basically just do it. Um, and then um, it will inherit up. We have uh, also have our uh, friendly compiler team at code, um, code actions in case you want to move tooltips down from the page to the table. And I believe if, if it's not there already, it will also be possible not only on the actual page, but on a project level or a folder level. Yeah, I'm afraid it didn't make it for this release, but okay. um, it will go out with a later um, compiler update where for the individual file or potentially even for the whole project, you'll do this. Got it. Yeah? Yeah, and actually with this tooltips, it gave us also a need to rethink how we actually store texts in the system. Because tooltips can be relatively large and we don't really want to store them together with the objects um, just like we do for captions. So behind the scenes, so here you'll get a small glimpse of what's happening behind the scenes. We have added new system tables to store these translatable texts. Now you'll be providing those through XLIF files or similar. Um, and then we will take them and store them in particular tables rather than in the normal metadata table. And Tooltip is the first usage of this, but we expect to expand this to also do captions, etc., because it allows us to cache more efficiently and avoid duplication of a number of these texts. So if you look inside the database in version 24, you might see some new um, system tables, both in the tenant database and in the app database. I'm not going to go into details what they are, but now at least if you look and you find these tables, then these are the tables being used to store the text metadata in an efficient way. And we expect uh, that this will allow us to search more efficiently and generally have a lower memory footprint. Mm -hmm. Now another, now let's switch gears to something more UX related. Now in previous releases, you know, well, you hopefully know that we added the ability to add navigation actions and fix it actions to error info. But we also know that there are hundreds or thousands of usages of test field in the product where you check whether a value is blank or similar. And of course, the best thing is to actually go and code it completely right with error info, etc. But we thought, well, how can we actually move this forward without putting a lot of burden on the application developers? So we've added new capabilities to test field so that it can add link to add a navigation link to the failing data. So the data that shouldn't be blank or the data that should be a given value. It will add this navigation link if a number of conditions are present. That it needs to be able to figure out what page to navigate to using drill down page ID and card page ID. The user needs to have read permission and it needs to be to a different record and a different page than you're currently at because you don't want a second copy of what you have already opened. So Jens, just for me to understand this, this, this means this is the, just the AL runtime that would do it. For these four conditions, we will add, uh, we will add to this new actionable error. Right? Yes, and if you take here, 
In the general ledger setup, if you set up an additional reporting currency, then you might see this error dialog with residual gains account is not being valid for this particular currency. Now, the runtime will automatically, in this case, add the show currency card link, which will take you to the currency card for the Australian dollars, the AUD in this case. And as you can see, then the residual gains account is indeed blank for this value. So instead of you having to know how to navigate using the normal navigation structure to currencies, we're now offering that directly from the error dialog if the conditions for showing it are fulfilled. Yeah. And this requires no coding on the app developers at all. So a certain percentage of the existing test fields will now have improved usability. Very nice, Jens. We also added, in case you need to handle errors, we added a, and added a lot of new content to our documentation for developers for error handling, including failure model modeling and a way to reason over errors called robust coding practices. So go check that out if you work in AL uh, so that you can create error messages that, well, that you can degrade gracefully in, in certain cases so that users don't get error messages. And if they do, there's also guidance here of how to express error, uh, errors in a language that users understand. And of course, use the new actionable error framework that was introduced last year. All right, now we want to talk also or mention another thing which is transparent for AL developers, which is that the server now runs on .NET 8. In previous release, we moved from .NET Framework to .NET Core, so version 23 was running on .NET 6. But for this release, we have switched to .NET 8, which is a faster and more efficient runtime. And whenever there, are, there is evolution in the .NET, stack, then we benefit from it. Now, this should be transparent for all AL developers. You can't feel the difference. However, you may feel a difference on your automation scripts against the server. Because with .NET 8, we're moving to PowerShell 7. So we know that there are a number of scripts out there, and we know that you may or may not be able to move directly to PowerShell 7. So we're also providing basically a bridge from PowerShell 5 into PowerShell 7. So you'll now have two sets of DLLs for the management operations. You will have the old admin, the, sorry, the old management folder, where we've consolidated the assemblers into one, the nav management DLL. If you call that, that will then relay the calls to the new PowerShell 7 DLLs, which are in the admin folder, meaning that you can still run PowerShell 5 scripts against uh, the server, but we highly recommend to move to PowerShell 7. And we'll deprecate PowerShell 5 within the next years. Yes, exactly. And so to summarize on the next slide, there. Go ahead, move to PowerShell 7. We do have a backward compatibility bridge, and which will call into the PowerShell 7 commandlets. It will be deprecated. Now, if you import the nav admin tool, um, then it'll automatically pick the right version. It'll check, are you running PowerShell 7 or are you running PowerShell 5? So in general, your scripts should still run if you have imported the old assemblies directly rather than through nav admin tool, then you may have to make minor changes. Cool. That leaves us to go do's for this session. Yeah. And some of the things to take away from this is to go ahead and optimize your number sequences. You can refactor it to use the new methods um, when you have restart scenarios or where you need to draw ranges of numbers. You can start using tooltips on table fields and get the benefit as we expand on that capability. And as just mentioned, refactor to PowerShell 7 scripts. And for error handling, start really think about using robust code practicing and failure modeling. Start using actionable error 
uh, where it makes sense and uh, adopt these new error message guidelines so that users have a better experience should your code uh, make an error. That's it. Other language, uh, sorry, other uh, launch event sessions that might be relevant if you are in this one. Uh, the first two here, what's new in Excel layouts and what's new in web services, are uh, the kind of the package on the L runtime. There's also, if you're interested in web services, uh, a, a learning session on all integration scenarios where we improved documentation for that. So if you're into web services, you might be interested in, into integrations and therefore that session could be relevant. And of course, if you are into the AL runtime, you are likely also a developer, AL developer. So the what's new in Visual Studio Code and AL development uh, is a session for you. And also there's a, a, a new uh, what's new session on key improvements in developer docs that you might also want to check out. Finally, a few AKA links as always. BC Yammer is your uh, Yammer is the place where we discuss things internally if it's not suitable for social media in, in general. BC All is the, the AKA link to, uh, to rule them all. Uh, BC Ideas is where you uh, talk about new features that you might want to add, uh, us to add to the product. And then for social media in X and LinkedIn, we are active in, on these platforms. Um, and finally, office hours in case you want to, uh, to attend live conversations about things or if you want to, to watch recordings of uh, uh, office hours in the past, the BC of office hours aka link is where you go. And with that, Jens and I would like to say, yeah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs>